Hi, welcome. Most of you know who I am. My name is Christopher Wilson. I'm on the board of the SAS. I also teach here at Raymond College. And I welcome you to this evening's event with Dylan Turk from the Crystal Bridges Museum. Uh, I want to thank uh, Raymond College, my employer, for the use of these wonderful facilities. This evening, we're very happy to welcome our guest speaker, and I will introduce our uh, board member, Ann Esner, to introduce Dylan. Thank you. <laughs> I'll introduce you. Thank you. Nothing if not compartmentalized. Good evening, everyone. Uh, it's really my pleasure to introduce Dylan Turk, whom I met uh, last fall when I was on a Ringling Museum trip to Crystal Bridges in Kansas City. And when I heard that they were going to have a, a trip to Crystal Bridges, I, I would defy to even find one person in this audience who doesn't know what that museum is and, and where it is. So uh, I jumped on the bandwagon and went out to Bentonville, and it was every bit the exciting experience I expected it to be. But even beyond that, uh, the museum had just finished its uh, restoration reconstruction of the um, Bachman Wilson House, which is by Frank Lloyd Wright. And it came from Somerset County, New Jersey, which is near where I used to live. So it was really kind of fascinating to see all of the, the work that had been done on the house, and it's gorgeous, and Dylan took us through. And Janet and I, ever the crafty people, had decided that if I was going out to Crystal Bridges, which is a huge, huge piece of property, that perhaps there might be a little space for a Walker guest house replica. <laughs> so I screwed up my courage, and after we went through the house, I gave him my packet of information, and we have been corresponding, and we've gotten to know each other a little bit. And before the Walker Guest House replica leaves its present situation at the Bringling Museum, we thought it would be really nice to have Dylan come out and see it in person, as well as tell us a little bit about what he does for the museum. So a very brief précis is uh, Dylan joined the museum about three years ago in 2015, and he was born in Arkansas, but he was telling me that he actually grew up in New Orleans with stints in Colorado. So he returned to Arkansas for college, and he graduated from University of Arkansas in, uh, with a major in history of art and architecture. So he's well suited for his job as curator of architectural projects, and he has many other things that he does, and he'll probably touch on that. So without anything more, I just want to welcome Dylan Turk. Thank you. Uh, first, I have been welcomed by some of the most amazing people in this town. Um, thank you, Janet and Elliot and Anne, so much. Um, I've never been here before, and it's just a, a real gem. Today, we went to see the Walker Guest House, and it's truly amazing. I'm sorry to see it be moving. I don't think it's the end of the Walker Guest House. I think it's just having a next chapter. Um, and so I'm excited to be here to tell you a little bit about what I do. Um, so first, I kind of want to tell you a little about, about where I am and what it's like in Northwest Arkansas, um, because the landscape and the topography really plays a lot into what I think about and talk about and exhibit because it's works of architecture. Um, this is the Boston Mountains, which are essentially the foothills of the Ozarks. Um, this is actually called Hawksbill Craig. Um, this is the small little town uh, where I live. Um, this is uh, uh, the town square. I actually live two blocks behind this. Um, and uh, this is essentially how it all goes. Um, I wouldn't exist without Walmart, so I have to tell you a little bit about how we got there and everything about it. Um, this is Walton's Five and Dime, um, which is Sam Walton's first, well, actually it was his second store. Um, it's still on the town square. Um, my museum is founded by his daughter, and um, she used to sell candy in this store. She was the candy curator. She got to pick what candy happened there. And this is a replica of his truck. This is the Walton family. Alice is on your far left. Um, 
And this is Alice today, and she is one of the best people you'll ever meet. I, I really, I wouldn't be able to do what I do without this person. Um, and so I want to tell you a little bit about how it happened and why it happened. And I'm going to tell you that while I have a video. And so Jonathan is going to help me out here while I do a little switcheroo. Okay, we're good to go. So Alice started collecting art um, in the late and the early 80s and um, realized in uh, the late 90s that her collection needed to be viewed um, and that she wanted to have real impact and leave some sort of legacy for this region that she loved so much. Um, and so her family donated 120 acres of their property um, right off the square. It's this beautiful Ozark ravine. Um, and commissioned Moshe Softy to design the building. And this is part of what I get to do. It's so exciting is this is my biggest object in the collection. It's the thing we all get to use. Um, and it's actually a series of eight buildings connected by glass walkways that bridge this natural body of water and dam it into places creating these ponds. Um, all of the materials of the house are co of the house of the building are concrete, copper, and glass and wood. Um, the same materials actually that Frank Lloyd Wright used in the house. I'm going to talk about a little bit later. Um, but we're on this kind of weird ravine, and you just stumble across this museum, um, and it's really quite unexpected. Um, this trail that we're about to see is how I walk to work in the morning, and it's this just kind of surreal place of peace and, and real beauty. Um, and so when the museum was getting founded, there was an idea that architecture was going to be one of the uh, pillars of the institution, um, and that would really be able to be served by the building itself. Um, and I do say that it is one of the most amazing feats and, and amazing buildings I've ever been in. Um, but we then realized that architecture doesn't just live in kind of these monolithic structures. Um, and to connect to the domestic, to connect to how we all live is the true way of kind of showing what architecture can be. Um, and so that's when we started kind of, that's when I was hired, um, and that's when we started thinking about how can architecture uh, seep into the walls, become part of the exhibition, but more importantly, how can we use this land that we have to be able to um, get people connected to these incredible spaces. Um, and so I just wanted to show you that video so you had a little bit of understanding of the place. And now I have to cancel this. Okay, we're ready to go. So this is the building. This is what happens when you first drive up. Um, you see this very small colonnade, this Roxy Payne tree off to the left. Um, and it's simple. Uh, rather than kind of climbing stairs up into the museum, the idea is that you would drop down into it um, so that it, it doesn't feel like you're walking across a, thread, a threshold or it doesn't feel unwelcoming. Um, our museum is, is free. Um, and so the idea is that we can get as many people into the place as you possibly can. Um, this is kind of looking out. I'm just giving a little bit of context to, to this place. Um, this is our restaurant. That's Jeff Koons uh, and a harp that we have in the restaurant. Um, some of our gallery spaces, our collection spans from 1657 all the way till today. Um, and we collect and acquire uh, pretty aggressively um, to be able to uh, share all of these incredible things. So this gets me to why I'm here. Um, and I want to tell you a little bit about this house, which has a, a weird way of connecting back to this project. Um, and this is the Shaven House, designed by Frank Lloyd Wright, um, and it's in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Um, it's a Usonian house, and I apologize for the quality of the next photo. It's not very good, but you can see the kind of form of the house. Um, and this house uh, was being designed by Frank Lloyd Wright, and in 1950, it was uh, construction began, and uh, he had this young uh, apprentice, Italian an apprentice named Marvin Bachman, and this is him on the left. And Marvin's job was to essentially be the liaison for Wright on that project. Um, so he worked in Chattanooga. He was from New Jersey. Um, that's his grandmother on the right. And um, in 1951, Marvin was killed in a car accident uh, while in Chattanooga. 
He was 23 years old. Um, and the house wasn't finished. It wasn't complete yet. Um, and so Marvin had a, a best friend and really was kind of his mother. Um, and that was his older sister, Gloria. Um, and this is Abe and Gloria um, on their wedding day, actually, which I love this picture in 1949. Um, and so Gloria and her husband drove down to Chattanooga um, because they wanted to touch the last thing that, she, that Marvin had touched. They wanted to essentially um, feel his presence. Um, and so once they got down there, they realized that they had to finish building the house. It had to be completed. Um, so they worked with the Shavens. They finished building this house. And um, they actually even helped the Shavens move into the house. And in 1952, are driving back from Chattanooga to New Jersey where they lived and um, decided that they needed a Frank Lloyd Wright house. And they, didn't have Frank, they needed a Frank Lloyd Wright house, one, because the, the architecture fit into the lifestyle that they wanted to have. Um, they had just had a, a small uh, daughter, um, and uh, Abe was a chemistry professor at Rutgers University, and um, Gloria was an amateur photographer. Um, and so, but, so they were thinking about architecture and that they knew they wanted a designed place. But Gloria wanted something that could almost be a memorial to the relationship she had with her brother. Um, and so they wrote to Frank Lloyd Wright. This is 1953. He's 83 years old. Um, he's building the Guggenheim, uh, Price Tower, and about uh, 30 other project, projects at the time. And he accepts the commission for the house. Um, they didn't really know what the house was going to be. Uh, they wrote back and forth in this incredible way, and we have all of the copies of the correspondence, um, talking about how do you want to feel when you're in the house? Um, why are you doing this? What type of music do you want to listen to? What kind of food do you cook? Um, and why did you pick that piece of property? Because there must be a reason that you're on that piece of land. Um, if you don't like the land, then don't build a house there. Um, and so they, they wrote about all of these things, and uh, Frank Lloyd Wright never actually visited the site that, where they were going to build. Um, and they bought this uh, lot in Millstone, New Jersey. Um, it's about 10 miles north of Princeton. And um, then they received this um, perspective drawing of the back of their house. And the house is a Usonian house, uh, which I can tell you, I think, probably you all know, but essentially in 1936, Frank Lloyd Wright has uh, built his first Usonian house in Madison, Wisconsin, and his concept was, I can take great architecture and I can make it more accessible to the average person. The middle class is growing, automobiles are becoming more prevalent, people can move out into the suburbs so that they can have more affordable land, um, and he thought he was going to build hundreds of these, 60 were built. Um, and his first house cost $8,000 um, in 1936. And um, our house in 1951 was a little bit more expensive. It was $30,000 at the end. Um, and Wright's fee was $400. Um, he never visited the site of a Usonian house, um, except for he did build a Usonian pavilion at the Guggenheim, but that's kind of more of an exhibit. Um, and that's a way to keep his fee down. So he used it as a training opportunity for these students to be able to go and learn essentially on the job. Um, they wanted a place that was going to be fun for their daughter. This is Hannah. Um, Hannah is one of the sweetest women you'll meet. She's in her mid-60s, lives in San Francisco and is a writer. And this is her playing dress up on the coffee table in the living room of the Bachman Wilson house. She's not smoking the cigarette, she assures me. <laughs> Um, one of the neatest things is when this project started, um, we did a lot of research and we're actually able uh, to find this guy, um, Robert Covelli, um, and he was a, a high school student in 1956, when they, or 1954 when they started building the house, and Abe Wilson hired him to essentially be a handyman around the house. The neatest thing is he documented the entire construction process. Um, and uh, we have now all of the original photographs that he took. And these are some scans of them, um, of seeing how this house would come together. Um, and this just like gets me excited when I'm thinking about how can we have facts, how can we tell the story, uh, how can we build an archive around this so that in 100 years people understand what the truth was and what was really going on. This is the site you can see. 
here, very kind of wild. Um, this is actually right after they moved in. Gloria took this photograph. Um, very wild. It's in the southern. Uh, it's in the eastern deciduous forest. It's surrounded by elm and sycamore trees. Um, and actually, Bentonville is in the southernmost tip of the eastern deciduous forest. Um, so there's this very similar uh, species of plant around it, and it feels uh, like the same type of terrain almost. This is from the back of the house, original. Inside, since Glory was a, a photographer, we have incredible images throughout the time kind of showing how they lived in the space. Um, here's the house in the original location. Here's the main street and the Millstone River. And these, this is a major character in the story. Um, Abe and Gloria wanted to uh, live as close to that river as they possibly could. Uh, they wanted a retreat, essentially, a place where they could escape and get away. Um, and so they actually set the house back. You can see the house is actually set back further than most of the homes in this kind of area um, so that they could be a little bit closer to the river. This is it um, in 2011 um, in the site. Um, at this point, someone in the 70s painted all of the concrete block um, kind of this tannish green color. Um, they also painted all of the mahogany on the exterior of the house um, a dark brown. Um, and at this point, the Tarantinos who lived in this house had uh, restored the wood, which they were able to do, um, but the concrete block essentially, they couldn't take that back to what it was originally like, which frankly, I wanted it to be totally untouched. Um, and so this is the house. And they're living in this house. They're the fourth people that have lived in the house. It's, this was kind of its setting and its original location. And um, in 1977, the house flooded for the first time from the Millstone River. Um, it was a couple of inches of water in the house at first. Um, this is actually um, Hurricane Irene in 2011. Um, ten feet of water got into the house. Um, and uh, this was a picture that Lawrence Tarantino took when he kayaked into his living room um, to see how everything was going. And this was the seventh flood. Um, and so at this point, um, the Tarantinos realized that it wasn't sustainable that it was not going to be able to remain there any longer. Um, and the flooding was happening because of uh, continued development in Princeton, um, more runoff, uh, and the water was essentially, this river was being affected by that. So that gets me to back to this house, which I haven't shown yet. Um, this is a 1956 Faye Jones house. Um, and this was designed and built for Sam and Helen Walton in Bentonville. Um, this is where Alice lives today. And it's this just beautiful, low-slung uh, cedar and rock house. Um, it's hard to see in this image, but I'll show another one. This is actually a, a creek bed, and this is up suspended um, uh, kind of over this creek about 10 feet above it. Um, and you can see how it's dammed here to create this pond, and this flows over the top and runs under the house there. Um, and this is actually what Moshe Softy saw that made him realize he should build our museum in the creek. Um, because he said, Faye Jones worked there for so long, his whole career in the Ozarks, he understood the Ozarks. He understood um, how the people felt and the vernacular. He, he had established essentially a Ozark modernism and um, Softy should take what he saw and be able to design the museum. But this house I think is so important um, because it established a foundation for Alice that she understood that everything she saw in the world came from that moment of growing up in this house. Um, that the appreciation from the natural world was because she lived almost outside. Her bedroom had sliding glass doors that were always open when the temperature was nice. The, the floors were made of Ozark sandstone. Um, she understood about uh, artistry and craft and the importance of how your everyday life can be enhanced by living in something beautiful. Um, and so it was at this point that uh, the Tarantinos in 2011 contacted the museum after seeing um, a CBS Sunday morning segment on Alice essentially announcing Crystal Bridges. Um, 
the Button Wilson House actually almost ended up in Fiesole, Italy, right outside of uh, Florence, because someone had offered to buy it and move it there. Um, but the Tarantinos didn't sell. I really am happy about that. Um, and contacted us and said, we think this house belongs there. Um, we've never even been to Arkansas, um, but there's something about it. There's something that makes us feel like this place is a kindred spirit with where this house is and the rich legacy of Faye Jones, who was um, Wright's, one, of, one of Wright's most uh, famous students and was the only Taliesin apprentice to win an AIA gold medal, and he won that in 1990. So uh, 2011, we're opening the museum. We think about 150,000 people are going to come that first year. 675,000 came. Um, so this went on the back burner. Uh, we were dealing with logistics. I wasn't even there yet. Um, and essentially kind of came back around in 2014 uh, to the house. Um, Alice couldn't stop talking about the house. And uh, we went to see the house. And it was beautiful. Um, so we purchased the home and uh, began taking it apart, um, which took about uh, six months to take the house apart. Um, and what you're seeing here is we actually worked with two teams. We had a team stationed in New Jersey um, that was doing the kind of wrapping and uh, staying to the process of the house. Um, we had a contractor. Uh, um, and our own team uh, that was up there monitoring that and then would bring it back down here. Um, uh, down here, we're not in Bentonville, down to Bentonville. Um, and uh, so it was pretty scary, uh, but it's board and batten walls. Um, and so essentially, once you unscrew the exposed screws, it starts coming down in layers. Um, and so then there's plywood behind it. Um, and the exterior walls are the same. It's mahogany, a little piece of felt insulation, and plywood, um, and then felt insulation and mahogany again. That's, that's it. Um, and then obviously the, uh, the structure is totally visible. Continue to take it apart um, and wrap it. Now we're getting a little bit more. Here's a picture of an addition. Someone put, put an addition on the house in the late 70s. Um, utilizing the carport uh, cantilever, we did not take the addition. Uh, it was not very good, um, and it wasn't designed by right, and really totally messed with the, the plan of the house, the entrance procession, and really kind of the whole integrity of the house. Um, so we did not bring that section of the home. Taking it apart, removed all of the wooden glass first, wrapped it, Brought it uh, 1,200 miles in pieces. This is an airplane hanger where, the, the, and I apologize for the quality of the photos, um, where it was all laid out, um, the furniture from the home, um, all in uh, this kind of warehouse. This was the moment when the contractor said, what the hell did we do? <laughs> and I said, it's too late. <laughs> We're already in. Um, and I love this. They all had labels, and here it says, handle with care. Um, and it's totally, this is from the living room and all of the pieces, because um, we wanted to, to be able to put every piece back where it came from exactly, um, if we could. So uh, the same time that was going on, we had a crew laying the foundation in, uh, at the site in Crystal Bridges. Um, with the water and just the kind of the nature of the structure, um, it's all one slab. Um, and so there was no way for us to move the slab. So we started with a new, um, a, a new foundation and slab uh, that has radiant heat in it. Um, and then we started taking the block down in New Jersey and it was disintegrating. Um, it's 50s block, water had been in and out of it. Um, and so we had a panic moment and uh, were able to do a little digging. The blocks were originally made by the Waylight Block Company in 1953. Um, that's since gone out of business. We were able to find someone who'd retired and was a former uh, block maker, essentially, for Waylight. Um, we brought them to Bentonville um, and had them make us a special batch of blocks to fill in the pieces that we needed um, with the same recipe process. Um, it's a different shape uh, to get the texture and porosity that the blocks had. Um, and so that was a kind of interesting, unexpected aside. Um, and so, 
starting 16 months it took to put it back. Someone asked if we had snow in Arkansas, we do. Um, here we're constructing it again, putting it back together. We had some real concerns actually with the wood. Um, the wood started twisting, these huge door fins started twisting really badly. Um, and uh, so what we ended up doing were essentially putting these metal little pegs down into the concrete um, and then drilling a couple of holes, putting it on top, using some adhesive, and slowly twisting the board back into shape. Um, that was a moment of, another moment of fear. Um, can this happen? <coughs> what other wood is messed up? It kind of opened up the floodgates, and that's when we pushed back the opening date by, by a little bit. Um, but it worked out really well, and we haven't had any issues. So here's the house now, um, and it's, I think, just totally gorgeous. But um, it's a totally concrete block, all Philippine mahogany. Um, you can see the carport off to the left. Frankly, Wright actually coined the term carport um, in the 1930s. And uh, the front door you can see is oriented towards the carport and away essentially from the street view. And where this photo is taken would be the procession from the street to the front of the house. Um, and that was because Wright thought that if there were no possible way that you, that outside views could enter your house, it would remove that kind of level of worry for you. That your, your life would be improved by being in a house that was a retreat, that essentially had its back to the community, um, that was this kind of nestle of intimacy. Um, and he thought that as suburban neighborhoods developed, this was going to be the answer to keep people sane um, and to keep people grounded, um, was to essentially prevent the nosy neighbor. Um, and you'll notice essentially all of his Usonian designs have this kind of fortress-like front wall, most of them not as monumental as this one, um, and that's because this is a two-story Usonian, and there are only four two-story Usonian houses. Um, and that really came from the Wilson's desire um, to have a second floor um, so that they could be as close to that river as possible and have views of the water from their bedroom. Um, and that actually added a little bit of cost into the house as well. Um, here's the carport, which I just talked about. Um, here are some things that we had to do. Uh, so they built an addition off of the inside of the carport. Um, we lost what was here. Um, all of this wood is actually new wood, and it's Peruvian mahogany. You can't get Philippine <coughs> mahogany anymore. Um, and this is not the design that Wright would have designed for this wall. Um, this is where we had to think about what are our long-term needs and how can we have data, <coughs> HVAC, security, all of these things in the house with the least amount of impact on the home. Um, and that's when we realized that we were going to utilize this side to have access to the basement. There's a full basement in the house, um, which Wright originally designed, but it was never built. Um, and so we took Wright's design for the basement and built it to hold all of this new material um, so that the interior would essentially remain as it had been. Um, and that's what you're seeing here with this, this door. This is the roof and this is when I just fall because this is why I get into this job. Um, you can see how he wraps the lines around the entire house. And when you're in the center of the carport, you can see them come together. Um, and this is the board and batten. Uh, the, the wide plank is the board, the, the smaller one's the batten. You can see the exposed screws. Um, we tried to use every single uh, nail hole that was already there, um, which was difficult. <laughs> um, um, so you'll notice if we, if we didn't use a hole that was there, you'll see a little bit of fill on it. The kind of procession up to the front door. Um, this incredible thing, he wanted the concrete block, the architect, the uh, off-the-shelf concrete block to really sing and to create some, some dynamic line. Um, and so he used a, a, a mortar treatment like he had done on many of his properties, like Roby House, for example, um, where he rakes out that mortar um, horizontally, really, really deeply. Um, but then in the vertical fills it in to be flush with the level of the block. So it creates these really beautiful lines that run down the house. Looking back out to the site, uh, this is kind of a front yard um, in the home. And this land here was previously undeveloped. It was just kind of wild forest land, which most of Crystal Bridges is. As you walk into the house, um, this is the front entry moment. 
Um, low ceiling, the ceiling's about uh, six foot nine on the ground floor and about six, seven on the upstairs. Um, a hanging stair that I could stare at all day. Um, totally supported by these kind of red uh, hollow poles and anchored into the concrete block on the side. Um, so it's a pretty tight little space. The house is 1,700 square feet. Um, and then you have this moment when you walk into the living room past the stairs uh, where that, and you're all familiar with this, I've been experiencing some of, so much of the architecture here where it's the compression and expansion moment. Um, and realizing that he wanted this room to feel as grand and as large as it could possibly be, the smallness of that entry space makes this space feel larger. Um, the height here is 16 feet. Um, we're lucky uh, to have the built-ins um, that survived, actually. About 97% of the wood in the house is original. Um, and that's pretty shocking, I think, because of all the flooding. Um, but it's a really hard wood, typically used for kind of marine construction. And this is if you're sitting on the couch, what you look out to. Um, the, the pattern on the top, clear story. So Wright, actually, his first independent commission, the William Winslow House, was, I think, 1893. And um, he had learned from Louis Sullivan. And Louis Sullivan was the master at bringing modernism and ornament together at showing that steel and concrete can have ornamentation, can be somewhat familiar. Um, and that has always stuck with Wright. Uh, so his very first house, the William Winslow house, and now I realize I wish I had a picture of it, um, but I can show you one or you can look it up. Um, he, he uses this terracotta black paneling right underneath the eave to make the roof feel lighter, to make the roof, roof feel like it's floating. Um, and I think this is a really wonderful progression all the way through to a house at the very end of his career, essentially, where he has the ultimate kind of moment of making clear story windows that have ornamentation on it and making that roof feel so light that it's supported by glass. Um, the, the pattern here is a Samara pattern, um, and Samara is a winged seed pod on maple and elm trees, um, the, the helicopter seed pods, and Wright loved how they moved in the wind. And he wanted that, that, that energy and that movement to come into the house um, and create this pattern on the floor. And it, it casts this pattern all the way through. And at sunset, finishes on this blank space above the, con above the bookshelf. Um, Samara also, in Hebrew, means protected by God. It's a name. Um, and the Wilsons were actually discriminated against really badly when they first started building this house um, because they were Jewish. And the architecture spoke to them. It had this fortress front wall. It created a pocket. It was crowned in something spiritual. Um, and Hannah, I've talked a lot with Hannah, and Hannah talks a lot about that and how um, they felt protected and safe because of the house. You can see the pattern there really well. It's hitting there on the, on the cushions in the house. Uh, so light was essential. Um, so we did a lot of light studies in the house in New Jersey before we started taking it apart. Um, and then we took that information actually and with the help of Marlon Blackwell, who's a, an architect based out of Fayetteville um, and really a nationally known architect, uh, we looked at about five different sites on our ground um, to be able to have the same sort of light interaction, to have the same sort of distance from a more public space like the museum and something that was domestic originally. Um, and so we, we settled on, on this location because we got wonderful light. So this is looking to uh, essentially the front doors here, fireplace. This mezzanine is cantilevered around the top, and that's where you get to the, the two primary bedrooms and bathroom, which is upstairs. Master on the back. Here you can see what I mean by the line. Follow that line all the way around, and you can see how it jumps outside and continues wrapping the house. Um, it's just gorgeous. You can trace this line all the way around to that carport moment when it comes together. Um, and then you can also see here the concrete floors, the red concrete floors. Um, we worked with the Frank Lloyd Wright Building Conservancy to essentially uh, get these matched as perfectly as possible. Um, and it's a four by four square is the, the pattern he used or the, the grid system he used for this house. You can see the burn and wear of fire. Um, 
I love these stacked fire, uh, fireplaces. He would, you would stack the logs vertically um, and lean them vertically in the corner. Uh, kind of one of my favorite stories about Wright and stacked fireplaces is when he designed uh, wing spread for S the S.C. Johnson family. Um, and they, it was kind of their first night in the house. They have the 16 foot high, uh, very, very narrow uh, vertical fireplace. And they stacked it with a bunch of wood and they were sitting in their living room and all of a sudden flaming logs started falling into their living room. Um, and so they pick the logs up, they throw them outside um, and then they call Frank Lloyd Wright and you know, are talking about this and he said, oh, well, you did it wrong. Um, you have, you're overstacking it. You need to have breathe and just have like two or three in there leaning up into the corner. It's delicate, don't overwhelm it. Um, that could be him just trying to pass it off, but I, I like it. <laughs> Uh, then you start moving into the dining space, and I'm doing a little bit of a walk through the house uh, just because I think it's important. Um, uh, the dining space, this table is actually two tables and it's not built in. Um, and so the concept here is that you can, three people can sit comfortably around the end of the house. The house was designed for three people. Um, and then more importantly, if you have more people over, move the table outside, move the table into the living space, take the table into a space that's filled with natural light. People get a sense of scale. Um, he, in a brilliant way, paints the edges of the, the um, plywood furniture with the same Cherokee red that the floor is. One, sealing the layers of the plywood together, but also grounding them. Um, you'll notice the furniture is rather low in the house, um, and that's because he believed the closer to the earth you were, the more connected to God you were. It was spiritual for him. Um, nature was spiritual. Nature was his God. He always capitalized it. Moving around into the workspace, which is what he called the kitchen. Um, this has had a lot of iterations, actually. The Wilsons had a galley kitchen here, um, and this kind of L-shaped nook over here was a laundry room you access from this back hallway. Um, Wright designed two kitchens and gave them the option. They picked the cheapest one. Um, so when the Tarantinos got in, they took that section out and essentially built Wright's version of that plan over in this section of the house. Um, you'll also see contemporary appliances in the house, and this was really important for us. We did not want to take this house back to 1956, and that's so that this can be a story of preservation, um, so we can talk about the livability of these structures, hoping to get more people interested in saving these structures and seeing how modern life can, can exist in historic properties. Looking back out to the front door, workspace. This is the guest bedroom on the first floor. It's the only bedroom on the first floor. This excites me. Maybe someone in the room will think so too. This is a Usonian one chair. It's three legs. It has a little cantilever on it. Um, I actually, to get it into this room, put it through that window because the hallway is too narrow for it to go down. So then you go up the stairs and it's this kind of um, sanctuary-like space. It's only the private, it's only the family space upstairs. Um, you can see how the light interacts um, with the house. The mahogany is just really, I mean, we restored the entire house at this point. So the mahogany is in really good condition right now. Only one thing broke during the move, and it was one of these windows. Um, it, was the, it was the casualty for the house. Master bedroom, pretty small. Um, oak floors, board and batten all around. There's a balcony over on this side that's quite large, actually. Um, none of this furniture in this room except for this chair is designed by Frank Lloyd Wright. This is what the people in the house had and lived in. It won't stay like this because I want to collect mid-century objects and fill the house with them. The main bathroom, cork flooring, skylight um, that was operable, it would stay open at most times. Um, original Kohler fixtures. And this is the child's room, which is, I think, my favorite room in the house. Um, it's playful, there's light, right? It's understanding that for a child, this is their active space. Um, and so it has to be different, it has to be more functional. Um, what appear to be built-ins actually aren't. This is the play table here that slides out into the middle of the room. The bed's on casters. Um, it, it, was, it was a living space, and it has a small balcony off on the front, uh, <coughs> on the front of the bedroom, which you can see right here. This is where Hannah grew up. She was seven when she moved in and 18 when she left. Um, we brought her to Crystal Bridges before we opened the house, um, right when it was finished. And she spent a week with us and it was 
a dream, but really funny because she'd never been to Arkansas, yet she was visiting her childhood home. <laughs> Off the front balcony. Here you can see the cantilever of the master balcony. Um, off to the back, and really just the beauty of the natural setting. We, we cleared essentially the front yard and a little sliver on the back here, um, but then like we do at Crystal we just leave it be. We, we garden with all native plants um, that are found in the area, and we have a staff of about uh, 30 people, an on-site landscape architect, and a staff horticulturist who, who control all 120 acres, and that was a really um, fun conversation with the horticulturists figuring out how can we be crystal bridges and feel like crystal bridges but also experiment with a little bit more domestic and scale uh, vegetation um, that would surround the house in a different way than around the museum. Um, so this is the back of the house um, which has total contrast to the front. Um, the back is I think beautiful um, and he saw the backyard as an extension of your living space, that these doors would always be open. Um, and so the back is inviting and feels like that living room. Um, one thing I love to point out here is if you look at the back of the house, you can see his study of classical architecture, the way the stairs step up, the proportions and rhythm created by these really kind of over accentuated door fins, and then this ornamentation on top looks very much like a Greek temple. From the other side, little built-in garden, migrant glass windows. And one of the neatest things is at night um, because it sits up kind of on this little bit of a ridge, um, a Taliesin-like ridge, if you will. Um, and when you're on these trails, it, it glows like a Japanese like, um, lantern. Um, and Wright, I think, would love seeing it lit up at night that you, when you're walking our trails, um, it's a feature on the, on the nighttime tour. So this was another thing. I was telling you about some modern things that we did to improve the house, or not necessarily improve the house, but make the house best for us. Um, one of those is adding air conditioning into the house. Um, and so here you can see the discreetest way we could uh, have the diffusers along the front window because it's single pane glass. Um, and so we didn't want condensation to start building up on the inside or the outside of the house. Um, and so we needed airflow running up those windows. Um, and I've never seen an HVAC person more excited about this event. <laughs> he talked about this event forever. I've been on tours with him where he'll, he'll bring his family to talk about the event. And it's just really cool. I love that he's showing his kid that his work is in a museum. Um, and it was really cool. After we opened, we invited all 127 people who worked on this house to an afternoon celebration to really thank them for everything they did. And it was so neat seeing all of their families um, there and having kind of uh, uh, revering their, their parents and revering their spouses and what they did. It was really interesting. One of the other things that we did is um, we realized this was an incredible opportunity to engage with the university. Um, I am an alumnus of the school, so I might be a little bit biased, um, but it's a really incredible program, the Faye Jones School of Architecture at the University of Arkansas. Um, and so we actually worked with two, uh, uh, two groups. Um, one of them um, was essentially a research bank. Um, we sent them, along with the university, to the Avery Library um, at Columbia, which holds all of Wright's papers and archives currently. Um, and they studied who Wright was, a deep dive into his practice and essentially gave us interpretive elements. They designed this, I'll tell you about it in a second, they designed this incredible model um, that weighs 7,000 pounds, not really, but it, our prep staff hates to move it because it's very heavy. Um, and then we worked with another group, a design build class, um, to essentially make this interpretation pavilion to be the thing that began to get you to the domestic scale, to be the place to understand who Wright was, to start acting as a tool to look at your space and understand how materials and light and line help you uh, feel and help you to connect with your natural environment. Um, and so they really, on the other side of this is, is the only entrance to the house, and there's the museum is right behind this vegetation. Um, so you have to walk through this. And we wanted that to happen because it, it closes or down around you and the students did a really great job. These are our students and my director of the museum, Rod. Um, 
and they looked at the clear story design of the Frank Lloyd Wright house and then looked at the curve curvature of uh, the Moshe Safdie building and they were inspired by uh, dragonfly leaves, uh, or dragonfly wings, excuse me, um, and put this pattern over the top using inexpensive materials, uh, uh, steel and plastic actually over the top um, to create this kind of pavilion that would cast light and shadow into the space. Here's the model, here's part of the model. Um, we call it the Buick. So we opened the house and uh, we knew there was a little bit of kind of want to see the house. We had no idea what it would do. In the first year we had 100,000 people through the house um, and we limited it to 15 people at a time. Um, you get a time ticket and then we also have four docent led tours a day that are about a 45 minute long experience. Um, and so it's totally changed everything about how we think about how architecture can exist in our museum. And so right on the coattails of that, um, we ended up actually acquiring this Buckminster Fuller Dome. Um, this is a fly's eye dome. Um, it's 50 feet in diameter, meaning at its widest point, which is about here, it's 50 feet across. It's about 36 feet high. Um, this is the largest fly's eye dome that Buckminster Fuller did. Um, and he did this in the very last part of his career. It actually wasn't even fully realized because he died in 1983. Um, and this was going to be his design for affordable housing. Um, that you could take a mold of a different shape and pour fiberglass into it and the fiberglass could be the skin of the building and the structure of the building. Um, that you could cover the lenses with uh, the lenses, the uh, oculi with clear acrylic lenses. Um, and that it would be very, very lightweight, which was important to Fuller. Uh, this weighs 10,000 pounds. Um, so we purchased this and realized, okay, how, what are we gonna do? How are we going to interpret this? Um, and so we thought about how, what we're gonna do to utilize about the 120 acres. This is the north side of our property. Uh, the Frank Lloyd Wright house is on the south side of the property. Um, and so we, at the same time, we're thinking about expanding in this direction um, and essentially connecting to about 34 miles of, uh, 34 acres that is up here that was previously undeveloped. Um, and so with that, we went back to Moshe Softy um, and we actually had, and it, actually the press preview for it was today, um, uh, had him build an elevator tower and a new entrance onto the museum. And what this does is actually connects the lowest uh, level of terrain in, on the complex to the highest, um, which is at the top of this ridge. And it adds another entrance onto the side, so now we have total access from the gallery to the north side of the property, so we can utilize it. Here it is. It's all copper. That's why it looks so fresh. And our roofs are all copper as well. Um, and so it will patina down to this brown color. This is amazing. Uh, I don't, how many of you have been to Crystal Bridges? Okay, um, well, I, I look at this building all the time and the first time I went up in this elevator tower, I saw the museum from like a totally new way. Um, Cause I'd never looked at it from this direction, never seen the top of this roof before. Um, and so I'm really excited about that. Um, so this is the creek as it transitions from being dammed back into natural water. Here's a Marc de Suvero sculpture and the North Tower and the entrance there. Um, and so this is the, one of the pictures we have in our archive. We also got uh, Buckminster Fuller's full uh, Fly's Eye Dome archive. We acquired it as well. Um, and it's never been processed, so it's literally boxes just slid off of tables. Uh, and it, my interns hate it. Um, <laughs> I love it though, because you find things like this. Um, this is Buckminster Fuller, John Warren, and honestly an unknown photographer um, shooting into this um, mirrored sphere inside of our dome at their um, Culver City studio in 1978. Um, and that just like, I'm so, I was so excited when I found this. Um, and so this was kind of this idea of how are we going to make this legacy live on? How can we take something that was unfinished, he died in the middle of the project, and embrace Fuller's spirit of innovation? and um, kind of leverage this to start a whole new direction of who we're gonna be in programming for what we're gonna do. Um, and so with that, we started thinking about the creative process and how does one, um, how do you take an idea and how do you realize it? Um, and so right now I'm working on a show that will open on July 1. Um, that's all of the work, not all of the objects, but 
everything in the show comes from this archive. And it's essentially looking at how does one create? How do we um, make something as bizarre as the Fly's Eye Dome? Um, this was our rendering. This is what we presented that would happen to the dome and how it would look on our grounds. Um, and this is in the slide because honestly I made the PowerPoint before it was built. Um, but today I got some images um, of it. Uh, this was the first kind of look at it through the trees, which really got me super excited. It took three and a half days to fully install, just FYI, which is mind-blowingly fast. Fuller said it would take 10. Um, and that was a moment where our whole team got together and was like, wow, it was above our expectations. It was real. The, these ideas, these things that we had been reading about, the, this, this man that we've become obsessed with, with new technology, it, it became more efficient. And that's what he always wrote about it. Embrace technology. Utilize crane if you have a crane. Um, and so this was really, uh, really cool. Forgive me, none of the landscaping are <laughs> just as built. Um, so it's still a site. Um, but this, I think, kind of gives you a sense of the scale and how it's going to feel on this lawn. This lawn will be all green, a total green space for it. Um, this is about the size of a human being, just to give you a sense of the scale. When you're inside, um, he, 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 it's called a fly's eye dome because he actually, and we have this article, he pull, pulled this newspaper clipping of an advertisement that on the top says um, something like live your life, discover truth or something. And on it was a blown up picture of a fly. And he had been racking his brain, how do I take the tensegrity structures and the geodesic domes and combine the skin and the structure? How do I pull it together? Um, and he said, a fly die, of course. Um, the exoskeleton serves as the, as the skeleton, but also the skin. Here it is with the, the little bit of softies work. Um, when this was announced in the newspaper, um, Moshe Softy sent an email to Alice saying, oh my gosh, this is incredible. Um, when I was building Habitat 67 in Montreal in 1967, uh, but Mr. Fuller was my mentor. He was the person who got me through that whole project. Um, and so he was thrilled that there would now be this dialogue between uh, his work and Fuller's. And this is one of our gallery spaces and looking out at the dome from the gallery. Um, which again, I think our whole museum is designed so that there are these in-between spaces like this where it feels inside but also outside at the same time. Um, and so I love how this can be pulled into this space um, and become a dialogue with works in the collection. On the other side of this wall, there's a, a Noguchi piece on that wall. And Noguchi and Fuller were incredible friends. And, and so it starts showing our staff and, and almost educating our staff and our audience that architecture and design is totally ingrained in the fabric of everything that we already do. And that's my lecture. Sorry. <laughs> Questions? Yes, sir. I'm sorry? There's a tremendous amount of wood. Yes. And how do you preserve that? We have a big staff. <laughs> um, um, Tuesdays were closed. Um, oh, there's a lot of wood on the inside and outside of the house. How do you preserve that? Um, and so I was saying we have a large staff that has the resources to be able to do that. Um, we monitor it like a collection object, essentially. Um, and so every six months, me and another group of people walk through the house, um, check on everything, make sure that it doesn't need repairs. But it is an object of architecture, so it's going to have to get modified. It's going to have to, uh, if wood's rotting, we'll replace it. Um, but do everything we can to hope that that doesn't happen. Yes? How about the transport of the Flies Eye Dome from California to Arkansas? Transport of the Flies Eye Dome from California to Arkansas? Actually really easy um, because it was already in pieces. It was actually, and I didn't say this, uh, Fuller was working on it. He convinced the mayor of Los Angeles to use the dome as the visitor center for the Los Angeles Bicentennial Celebration in 1981. Um, and so what that did is actually got fuller funding from the city to pay for something that he had already built. 
Um, <laughs> and so what he did is he uh, essentially built it there. Um, and when it came down in at the end of 1981, it went into this warehouse and it sat in this warehouse. Um, Fuller was working actually with Norman Foster um, and John Warren. Um, and they were working to essentially figure out some of the problems. How do you get into it? How do you have air conditioning? How do you have some realities? Um, and then Fuller died in 1983. Um, and so it kind of is left hanging in these archives, in these journals, um, which reminds me, I have a really cool story I should tell you. Um, we were looking through the journals and I found a beer recipe in one of the journals. And I said, I think this is a beer recipe. Um, and so I talked to our culinary director. He said, yes, that is a beer recipe. And then now we've talked to Ozark Brewing Company, which is kind of one of the most successful brew companies in the area. Um, and we're going to collaborate to make a beer inspired by this recipe. And then do a program around it to get people to, we want you to understand what Fuller was thinking and we think sometimes that comes through a drink. Um, and so we're going to do a program where we can bring these people together, show off this collaboration, um, and really I think it is in the mission of Fuller to bring people together and really share knowledge. So that's something that's pretty cool. Yes, sir. So um, the cinder block issue that it was painted, did you replace all of the cinder block or did you try to do something? Was it all replaced? Yes, all the cinder block was replaced. And so you took it back to... We have all of the cinder block, actually, at, at the museum, what was left um, that didn't disintegrate. Um, it, it, I mean, I can't even describe. Once you touched it, it was just falling totally apart. I um, mean, so the painting wasn't the biggest issue. Um, the biggest issue was really just the integrity of the, of the structural object. Um, and that was a big moment for us to think about how can we truly preserve, how can we truly restore something when all of the block is going to be from somewhere else and it's new. Um, and so for us, it really was able to tell the story and talk about um, how you can live in these houses. <laughs> and I think this community is such a, does such a brilliant job at that, um, that they're part of our history, they're part of our community, they're our culture, and so it's important to protect it. And sometimes you have to pull a guy out of retirement to build a new batch of blocks for a house that was built in the 50s. Um, and, it, and it works. I think it, some of you who have visited would, would say that it, it feels um, true. Yes? With the extra acreage that you guys are talking about, the 30 some odd acres, yeah. are you planning to bring in other masterpieces? Um, acreage, are we planning to bring in other masterpieces? Whew. I need a, I need a break. <laughs> um, no, uh, yeah, I think what, what I want to do next is uh, do some more uh, contemporary architecture. And that's one way that we're actually doing it. Um, so how do you have, I don't want to be a place where you just collect structures. Um, it, both of these two structures, they needed a home. They needed a place to go. So that falls into masterwork needs saving. We have resources. Let's do it. Um, if it doesn't need to be moved, don't move it. Um, and so I was thinking about this, and we need to be able to tie our historic back to contemporary. And the only contemporary thing can't be the Moshe Softa building. Um, and so in that 30-something acres, um, we realized we needed to have a bathroom. Um, and it sounds so ridiculous, but beauty comes through these things. Um, uh, Louis Kahn actually built a beautiful bathroom. Um, and so we started talking about it and convinced the director to fork over the extra cash. Um, and essentially now it's under construction. Um, are working with El Dorado architects. They're out, they're out of Kansas City. Really good work. Um, they're, they're kind of emerging. Um, and David Dowell is kind of the principal there. And we're working on a bathroom that will be a tool for understanding light. It's a, it's a place of total contrast. The exterior is all black wood. Um, the interior is white and black, so when, and with all of these win, uh, light wells. Um, and so when you're in the space, you start understanding how light affects you, um, and that a bathroom can be peaceful, it can be beautiful, um, and it can teach you something about architecture. Um, and so that's one way that we're pushing out the program into other things, because architecture is best when it works, when it functions, when it does its job. Um, and so that's one way that we're doing it. And, um, but I can't say no tomorrow if something happens and there's another structure. Will that happen? Who knows? 
Um, but that's where we are now. Yes? Is the fly zone intended to be a livable space? Is the fly zone intended to be a livable space? Yes. Um, and it would happen by, oh, that's not on there. Um, he thought that there would be three stories inside, um, and he actually was working with Norman Foster on, this, on the design of uh, this flooring system that would essentially be a, independent from the external structure, um, and it would stack three levels inside, and there would be a spiral staircase. Um, he thought that your kind of ground level would be a place for business so that you have revenue coming into your home. Mid-level would be your primary living space. Um, and then the top level could be an outdoor space and a garden. Um, so he was thinking of it as being somewhat sustainable. Um, when you break it up, you get something like 8,000 square feet um, if you break it into three spaces. Um, and so it actually is rather large. It never existed like that, though. We have, a we have the model for the stairs. We have the drawing for the stairs, I mean, for the flooring system, but it never, it never was realized. So that's another situation where we're talking about, and I'm thinking a lot about, can we do that? Should we fully realize this? Um, is there a way to have, maybe not mess with the integrity of the object because it's an accessioned object, but think about how current thinkers and contemporary thinkers would move his needle forward um, and could make it livable again. And so I think that there's something there with some sort of temporary architectural exhibit or installation or something like that. Any other questions? Yes. What is this? The significance of the name of the museum? Uh, significance Crystal. of the name, yes. Um, uh, Crystal Spring um, is actually right behind this house, um, and it, it begins there. It produces about 100,000 gallons of water a day. It's totally drinkable. It's always cool. Um, it was actually the primary water source for the first settlers of Bentonville in the 1830s. Um, and so that was always there. Actually, one of our docents' great-grandfathers was baptized in Crystal Pond, which I think is amazing. Um, and so uh, Moshe Softy actually, I can tell you a little bit of this. So Alice Walton is thinking about how can um, a museum be more than a museum? How can it be a community center? How can it get people to look at their reality in a new way? Um, and so she went to the Skirball Cultural Center in Los Angeles, which Moshe, Moshe Softy designed. It was actually under construction and she kind of broke into it, but that's another story. Um, and she then called Moshe Softy and said, hey, I want to fly you to Bentonville um, and talk about a museum I want to build. Um, that was a summary of that call. But uh, anyways, he came out there and realized, uh, originally he was thinking of building on top of the hillside overlooking the ravine. Um, but realized after seeing that Faye Jones house that it needed to be in the water, it needed to be a part of it. Um, and that nature would be the primary exhibition that was running at the museum. Um, so actually when you're in the ravine, every single, uh, tr there's not a part of the building that's taller than the trees. The tree line is always high around you um, so that you feel the protection as well as your place in the world. Um, and so Moshe was thinking, okay, well, Crystal Spring water is running through here um, and there are these two bridges that I'm making going across and Moshe named, named the museum. Uh, we knew that it would not be named after the Waltons. Alice didn't want that. It needed to be something accessible and connected and um, contemporary and kind of loose of baggage. Um, and so that's how the name happened. I went on a long tangent to get there, but I hope it was enjoyable. What was the cost of the museum? Cost of the museum, undisclosed. <laughs> <laughs> Expensive. <Yeah>. Um, <laughs> any other questions? I will be hanging out, so if you have questions and want to talk independently, please let me know. Thank you so much for having me.